you very much to, for everybody to have me here. So I'm going to talk about suspended animation. Suspended animation, when you hear this word, your mind probably is thinking about uh, space traveling, you know, or biostasis, or transhumanism. But actually, this is the second talk on suspended animation that was presented in a TED talk. The first one, by Mark Roth, uh, he's a pioneer in the field. And in 2005, he published a paper that really pushed the field ahead. And as he was saying, we're not talking about space traveling in this kind of field. So the first thing we have to do is defining exactly what suspended animation is. So for the simplicity of the talk, so not to go into detail, not too much scientific jargon, we can approximate um, some suspended animation to hibernation, a special kind of hibernation, an hibernation that is induced artificially in some animal, even humans, that cannot hibernate naturally. So it's a specific kind of, of behavior. What exactly is hibernation? I'm sure everybody is familiar with this term, but you can see here a marmot, and a marmot is an animal that lives in the Alps, and uh, the marmot can survive a long period without uh, feeding or without drinking, so with lack of resources, simply by entering this special stage. You know, every mammal keeps a body temperature around 37 plus minus 1. So uh, we humans, uh, bears, uh, marmot, mice, every mammal. And mammals that can hibernate have a special ability to cool down their body, to cool them down quite substantially. In this case, this marmot, you can see here, this is the body temperature of the marmot. From 37, it drops to about 10 degrees Celsius, which is only 5 degrees above the ambient temperature. And how does the marmot do that? This is key if we want to try to mimic hibernation. Well, the marmot does it, and not just the marmot, the bear, the bats, every, every animal that does that. Um, it drops its metabolic rate. What, what is met the metabolic rate? It's the amount of energy, the amount of work that your cells uh, do in your body. So the more uh, the cell works, the, the more the chemical reaction are now engaged in creating and expanding energy, and the more you produce in heat. So the marmot does first stop this kind of work, their cells stopped working, and, and the, as a consequence, the, the body temperature drops. But that's not what we commonly experience. When, when we go out, imagine to be like, you know, in, in, uh, in Greenland and you want to you know, take a dive into an ice field, but you're going to wear your swimwear, well, then you're not going to really experience hibernation. You're going to experience cold. And there, your body will react to this cold, activating the organ that are dedicated to this kind of response. So we'll activate specific targets, like the brown adipose tissue, the white adipose tissue, the muscle for the shivering. The skin will you know, reduce the amount of blood that goes there, so we'll, you will reduce the amount of heat you radiate in the environment. So, so you want to keep your heat inside. And that is very important for us, for every mammoth, because of one single thing. The brain works very well at 37 degrees Celsius plus minus 1. So that's the, the temperature the brains need to have to work correctly. And we don't want to lose this ability, because if the brain cools down, then we are not more able to engage the environment correctly. So we'll not be able to you know, look for, for food or to fight in case or, or any kind of activity. The question is, why some mammals can hibernate and some not? So where the, why the marmot can do that and why we can't? And this question uh, requires for us to go you know, a little bit in the past, like 65 million years in this case, when the dinosaurs were ruling the herd. This was the time when the first mammal appeared on the herd. And you, know, you can imagine it was a, a really hard environment. You get you know, a T-Rex just out of your nest, and a velociraptor right there. So for a small mammal, it's a hard life. And how do we survive this kind of time? Well, the major step in evolution that allow us to, to be here, you know, those were our ancestors, in my opinion, was exactly the ability to produce heat from within. So you know, you have ever seen probably a lizard in the sun. And why the lizards go in the sun? They go in the sun. This is the temperature, the body temp brain temperature of the lizard because it needs to warm up their brain and their muscle. And they use the sun to do that. So in the morning, the lizard goes in the sun, the sun warms it up, and then in the afternoon, the lizard is active and you know, go on with his life. And then in the night, the temperature goes back again to ambient temperature. So at night, the uh, reptiles are not very active, and that's how a mammal can survive in the land of dinosaurs, can be active at night when the dinosaurs are not really active. And so, <coughs> being active at night requires a lot of energy. 
because there is not the sun that can give you this energy. So you need more food, and that's okay. But you also, you can use a strategy. You can sleep during the day in your nest, and even more than sleep, you can enter, uh, let's say, a short, per, a short version of hibernation that is called torpor, which you can allow you to drop the body temperature and to save a lot of energy. So the first mammal was able to do that, our ancestor. And the question is not why some mammal can hibernate and some not. That would be a wrong question to ask. Because our ancestors were able, we should be able to. So the real question is, uh, how is it that some mammals have lost the ability to hibernate? No, we, we should all be able to do it. So if you look at this picture, this will show you all the family of mammals. And you can see all those colors dot here are a species or a group of species within the family that can enter torpor or hibernate. And you see, there is not a single group. They're, they're spread through all the arc. And that means that the gene set that should allow you to survive this kind of process, it should be shared, it's common. I, I bet on this, it's absolutely common through all the mammal species. And then leads us to the question and to the observation side, how do you then trigger this back again? How do we hibernate and non hibernators? Because that's what we want to do. Well, the first shot, uh, was reducing cell metabolism. I told you at the beginning, remember, the marmots you know, stop the activity of the cells. Cells start working less chemically. So if we can you know, have a molecule that can heat the cell and reduce the amount of energy that can, gets um, produced in the cell, then the body will cool down. And that was a, the first approach that was used by at least three major authors and three major papers in the past you know, five, actually seven years. Um, and it, works very, it worked very fine in the animal model that was chosen. In this case, the animal model that was chosen, it's really important, remember, it was the mouse. So all the experiments were conducted in mice. The problem with the initial success in trying to do this was that when those treatments were translated to non-hibernating animals, they weren't as successful as they were on mice. And that's probably because mice can do they can enter hibernation uh, in very specific conditions. It's not really hibernation, it's torpor, like a, a smaller version, it's a smaller cuisine of hibernation. But they can do so. The animal model may not be the, the right one to choose, and that's because molecules and chemicals that stop the energy um, supply, let's say, in the energy process in the cell, are often interpreted as poison. Like cyanide, for instance, uh, that's exactly what the cyanide does. It is blocking the energy production in the cell. So the mice may have reacted to these chemicals like if it was in the presence of a poison and then uh, has entered torpor to try to defend themselves. So the question I, I was asking myself was, is there another approach that we could use to induce hibernation in a non-hibernating animal? So the, the previous approach had the theoretical background was the idea of a magic bullet, like an hormone, something that is inside hibernating animals that, that can go to every cell and, and, and do exactly this. But I think hibernation is so complicated as a process that it has to be regulated by the brain. The body goes through major changes during this process, and, and the brain has to be in charge of this. So the question was, can we trigger suspended animation acting on the brain? Can we you know, hack the, the central command and, and goes into and, and trigger hibernation. So this is a complicated slide, and this is the neural networks that control the body temperature uh, regulation. You know, it, it, it was pretty much discovered in the last 10 years in fine details, uh, but I'm not gonna go through all the station, we don't need to, but I like to highlight this area here. You can see this is a brain slice, and this small area there uh, represented schematically here is this little group of cell here where there is this green dot. Uh, it's called Rafa pallidus, and it's a very small group of cells, but is in charge of controlling every organ that reacts to cold when you are in the cold. So remember the two models before in the snow? Well, they're brown adipose tissue, they're heart, they're shivering, they're muscle, they're thyroids, they're, they're livers. Everything involved in energy production is controlled by a single group of neurons that is in this small area. And the idea was if we could block the activity of those neurons, then we could eventually induce a uh, torpor state. And did we do that? Yeah, we, that's what we've done. This is, a, this is a raw recording. This is actually an experiment conducted. And to avoid the, the mistake that was done before, it's not really a mistake, but uh, to be ex more confident in our data, we didn't use the mouse as a model, but we used a big rat. And rats are, imagine, like 20 times bigger than a mouse, and they never 
never under any circumstance and go into hibernation or torpor. So we want to see if this was going to work in a non-hibernating animal. And so here we block the neuron that we see, and this is the temperature, brain temperature of our animal that drops from 37 to 20 in an ambient temperature of 15. So five degrees above ambient temperature, the same as the marmot was doing before. And then when we warm it up, it became back to normal. You couldn't tell the day after that this animal went into an artificial form of uh, a suspended animation state the day before. No consequences at all. And that was obtained acting only on a specific single group of neurons within the brain. So no drugs administered to all the body. Just a little part of the brain was able to you know, highlight and uncover or unmask, if you want, this kind of possibility in our body. You can also see, I'd like to point out that other uh, you know, vital variable, like this is arterial pressure, they don't drop. So it's not a collapse. You're not cooling down because you, know, you faint. It's, you cool down because your body let you cool down. You can see here that this is our infrared recording of the animal during the inducing a suspended animation. You can see that he is, you can see the red is warm, it gets colder and colder, and here you can barely distinguish for the environment. It's in term and balance with the environment. So it got really cold. So what can we use this for? Well, the, the usual thing would be, if there was a slide here, to um, cool down the cells when the cells are suffering. They're, they don't have uh, no supply. So like we say, the marmot can survive longer period of time, can cheat time, reducing their consumption. As well can do neurons, for instance, in a, a, heart, a heart arrest or a stroke, or any kind of circumstance where the blood cannot supply precious cells like neurons with this kind of circumstance. But that, that is the trivial answer. And a talk on suspended animation usually will end with this kind of thing. But I'd like to tell you one more thing about what we found that I found really interesting. This is the, the brain of an animal during the cooling. And this is the activity of this, of this cortex. And it slowed down progressively. So what really happened? What does it mean to be in a suspended animation state? It's like a movie that goes now on the screen. But the frame and getting slower and slower and slower and slower. And not just the slower, the, the, the color in the frame are getting you know, shallower and shallower. And at the end, you get just a big gray frame that doesn't go anywhere. And that is really interesting. And why this happened? Because during suspended animation, neurons are not connected between themselves anymore. They tend to disconnect. So the neural network that represents the, the world in our mind when we are awake during hibernation, during suspended animation, they are not there anymore. So it's like disconnecting reality in some way. It's like a dive into dementia. Wonderful thing is that you dive into dementia here. This is a representation of the cortical activity in color. The less color you see, the less activity you get, just to give you an idea. But when you wake up, you get into a mode of hyperconnectivity, if you want. So re recreate all the connection that you had before, and even more. And then, the sleep that you will do later will you know, readjust the extra synapses that you make. But the idea that we didn't expect at the beginning now is to try to exploit this super connectivity to increase synaptic plasticity in conditions like Alzheimer's disease of neurodegenerative disorder, where this kind of uh, connection are kind of lost. So this very much is an unexpected finding. And um, I like to finish my talk with a general conclusion of what I could say, that this experiment was um, driven by what is called curiosity-driven research. So it was, we, we just did it because we were curious about what, what could happen, and, uh, and we got a great finding. But today, science is unfortunately, through, through all the world, uh, often like constrained in border, there are bureaucratic borders. So we, we aim to marginal improvement, or either to grant writing or to publish paper, and we have to do little step after little step. But this bureaucratic cage is kind of suffocating the kind of science that can lead to big breakthrough. So I would be happy if um, you all with me will support science, because supporting this kind of science, after all, it means supporting freedom. Thank you very much. Bravo Matteo, complimenti. Grazie. Passiamo in italiano. Passiamo all'italiano, okay. che è già è, è meglio in italiano. E ti volevo fare un, una domanda. Così certo. Parlavi 
nel, nel tuo speech che questa, queste scoperte apre eh, insomma, degli, delle opportunità nuove, se ci potevi anticipare qualche, qualche cosa in merito? Sì, certo, l'azione la, sulla plasticità sinaptica era solo una delle cose che non ci aspettavamo, ma la stessa area che usiamo per indurre questo stato di animazione in sospesa in realtà controlla anche altri organi che sono interessanti, per esempio l'osso. Tu sai che se, se un malato o un paziente resta immobile per molto tempo, una malattia debilitante, c'è un problema di riabilitazione, i muscoli vanno un po' in atrofia, le ossa si demineralizzano. Questo non succede negli animali che ibernano. Pensate all'orso polare, di solito che non sta magari sei mesi in ibernazione, quando esce è pronto per andare a caccia, quindi non ha questi segni. Noi riteniamo che questo possa essere comunque guidato da questo tipo di controllo centrale, quindi ci sono diciamo, altri aspetti, lo stesso pure non urina per esempio per sei mesi l'orso polare, quindi eh, anche in questo caso i reni vanno incontro a una modificazione interessante, allora riteniamo sia un modello di studio che possa diciamo, far ventilare sviluppi consistenti. Apre nuove sì, frontiere. Assolutamente, assolutamente. Va bene, grazie di essere stato un piacere. Ciao, ciao Matteo, grazie.